Hey guys, it's Pastor Dwayne here. So uh, today's going to be a little bit of an interesting one. If you have been hanging out in the uh, New Testament Textual Critical, New Testament Textual and NT Textual Criticism Facebook group, you've seen me asking questions about locations and geography. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do was come on and share uh, just some stuff that I've been thinking about in regards to geography and the long ending of Mark specifically. Um, but I wonder oftentimes like how much geography matters when it comes to determining the text of scripture, uh, or at least when it comes to, you know, textual variants and things of that nature. So I, I'm just kind of thinking through what the implications would be when we take geography into account uh, for something like Mark 16, uh, 9 through 20. Now, I know that everybody here knows what Mark 16, 9 through 20 is. I'll probably pull that up in just a minute. But in the meantime, you can probably see on my screen, I'm still getting the technical details of these live streams figured out. Um, you can see that I have the comments going there in the left side of the screen. And uh, I'm going to be switching things. Um, back and forth from my view here, where we're going to take a look at some geography in regards to Mark 16, 9 through 20, and then back to our main screen here. So um, shout out to everybody who's in there. Daniel Buck, Covington Music. I've not seen you around before. Uh, Pastor Brett. How's it going, Pastor Brett? Good to see you. Uh, Heaven Jones. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Heaven Jones. I, I think you told me it was heaven last time. Uh, James. Yes. I, I see you post that comment. Oh, I'm just going to read it. This is our... This is our uh, first bit of analysis on Mark 16, 9 through 20, brought to you by the scholar James Sheffield. And he says that, uh, I'll just read it. The tradition is that Mark recorded Peter's sermon. We have all been in a sermon when the preacher realizes that he has gone on too long and finishes up fast, which fits Mark 16, 9 through 20 blessings. I get a laugh every time I see that. Um, yeah. Yeah, sometimes I go on a little bit and then I just kind of finish things up quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's come down here to the comments. Uh, staring at his screen on your mark. <laughs> on your mark, nice. Here's Johnny. No, I'm doing. I, I probably missed that. Um, just for those of you who are frequenting the uh, Facebook messages, uh, Facebook groups too, um, I'm still a Byzantine priority guy. I didn't I didn't change the fence. Haha, <laughs> April Fools. Even though it's not April Fools anymore. <laughs> yes, it's heaven. Good, good. Uh, we got someone from Brazil here, Corsario Euclair. Very good. Good to see you, Andy Nguyen. How's it going? Good, good. All right. So let's let's start off this. So in in the um, discussion around geography, the first thing we have to make um, a, a, not an assumption, well, I guess kind of an assumption, but not really an assumption. Uh, the first thing, the first thing that makes sense for this discussion is to know where the gospel of Mark was initially written. So if we flip on over here, I'm going to share that and we'll pick a nice red. Uh, yeah, that's good. My cursor's nice and big. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, there's probably a setting something. That's okay. You'll see where I'm writing that here. So, uh, we'll start off here. Uh, I don't know. We'll say probably about here. We'll just, oh, that's not red. There we go. We'll say here, this is Rome. We'll just say that's Rome. Let's just pop that in here. Rome. And so this is apparently where the Gospel of Mark was initially written, was there in Rome. So uh, I am a friend with Wilbur Pickering. Ah, oh, very good. Uh, that's cool. I think, I think you've asked me a few things before. Ah, vast James. Army matey. All right, so we have Rome right in the middle of Italy. Okay, that's just an approximation. Okay, I'm not going too crazy about that. Um, but I want to pull up my notes here because I got some good stuff. I'm going to pull it over here just so I'm not ruining. So we're going to start with Rome as the place of origin for Gospels Mark. And this isn't just pulled out of thin air. We're not, we're not just making that up. So uh, we begin with Eusebius. Uh, I think it was some some point in the 300. He was, he was a church historian. If you don't know who Eusebius is, um, you need to go figure out who he is because he's a very important figure in church history. Um, so he tells about Papias and he records from Papias this. He says, and the elder used, used to say this, and he's referring to John the apostle here. <coughs> Mark became Peter's interpreter and wrote accurately all that he remembered, not indeed in order of, of the things said and done by the Lord. For he had not heard the Lord, nor had followed him, but later on followed Peter 
who used to give teaching as necessity demanded, but not making as it were an arrangement of the Lord's oracles so that Mark did nothing wrong in thus writing down single points as he remembered them. For to one thing he gave attention to leave out nothing of what he had heard and to make no false statements in them. So first point here is that uh, according to Papias, um, Mark was Peter's uh, interpreter. I think I think we use the term amanuensis for that. He was a secretary, wrote down all the things that he said. I don't know if he was a secretary or not. I'd, I'd be curious to, like how official this was. Um, but anyway, so we have Mark. Mark here is definitely the guy who wrote it. You you look all throughout the, the church history. Mark's always been attributed to it. Titles on the manuscripts have always been attributed to Mark. There's no question um, that Mark is the one who wrote the gospel. Um, but we come down here, and this is where we get it from Irenaeus. And again, this is uh, Eusebius in his uh, church history quoting Irenaeus says, Matthew composed his gospel among the Hebrews in their own language. Okay, so that, that's an interesting conversation all in itself. And then he goes, while Peter and Paul proclaimed the gospel in Rome and founded the community, after their departure, Mark, the disciple interpreter of Peter, handed on his preaching to us in written form. Okay, so here we have, yeah, there you go. Amenuensis, the secretary who says amen. Yeah, so here you have, um, you have Mark left in Rome, leaving the words of Jesus in written form. Okay, that, that's got to be the gospel, very highly likely. And now, of course, everything, when you start talking about church history, just about everything you talk about is, uh, is going to be controversial, and there's going to be someone over here who says it's not. And someone. So, but, but for, the sake, for the sake of this discussion today, we are going to take these quotes here, and we are going to make this the basis of us saying that Mark's gospel was probably written originally in Rome. So we come back to our... Um, our screen here, we have it right there, right in the middle, Rome. That's where we're beginning. Now, let me, uh, I gotta, there we go. Now you can see me in all the comments. That's better. There we go. Uh, Mark was a contemporary of Paul and Barnabas. Yes, he was. Uh, I am a friend of Wilbur Pickering, yet we touched on that. I think you had asked me a while ago. This is for Corsario. Do you have a YouTube channel and you talk about uh, F35? Uh, leave that in the comments there. I'd be curious to see. If you are the one I'm thinking of. Uh, so let's go back. We'll grab my notes here. There we go. So now we, we take a look at what happened from Rome. So the earliest uh, potential evidence we have of any long ending um, that we can peg down geographically would be Justin Martyr. Okay, Justin Martyr was a bishop in, in, uh, in Rome. And he is quoted, he, he's quote, he's a fairly long quote here. And it says this, this is Justin Martyr. Uh, I forget what year that was. I think that was like 150-ish or is that too late? I have a feeling that I didn't write the date down. I, I think this is like the very end of the first century um, to the early part of the second century. <coughs> um, Justin, Justin Martyr says, that which he says, he shall send to thee the rod of power out of Jerusalem is predictive of the mighty word which his apostles going forth from Jerusalem preached everywhere. Okay, that, that's the key, going forth from Jerusalem, preached everywhere, because what that phrase does, preached everywhere, links back to Mark 16, verse 20. And Mark 16, verse 20 says, And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Okay, so that's Mark 16, 20. So there's a definite illusion. Uh, I know, again, this is probably going to be um, contested by a number of people, but this seems like a, a definite illusion to the end of Mark 16. So we have our first, uh, our first um, uh, reference to something in the long ending. Uh, from Justin Martyr. So we plop that in our graph. Let's just pick a green color here just because. Uh, let me see. We'll pull that up. I wonder if there's a quick key that I can change this. So if we come here, let's do let's do green. Oh, I just erased Rome. I just deleted Rome. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. There we go. That's what I was doing wrong. Um, so we got Justin Martyr. We'll just put JM. I used to work for... Uh, a guy whose initials were JM. Um, all right. So we got Justin Martyr in the or, or late first, early second century uh, in Rome. That's key in Rome, right? We're taking a look at the geographic argument. Uh, so let me pop my notes back up here. So after Justin Martyr, we have uh, Irenaeus and Leons, right? This is probably one of the most famous quotations. Again, I didn't write the date. I don't know why I didn't write the date on here. Uh, Justin, not a bishop according to standard understanding or more revisionist work like Peter Lamp. Okay, yes. 
Nonetheless, Justin Martyr, an important figure in the early church. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we come to Tatian. Uh, no, Tatian. We'll, we'll do Tatian next because there's some complication, or complicated stuff. Not complicated, but uh, we come to Irenaeus, who again, straight up quotes Mark uh, 16. Uh, the quote I have here is also toward the conclusion of his gospel. Mark says, So then, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sits on the right hand of God. Again, a passage here that's definitely going to be from, um, from the long ending of Mark. So we have Irenaeus uh, in Leon's uh, quoting the, um, the long ending of Mark. So where is Leon's? Right, That's somewhere in France, modern day France. We kind of come up on our map. So somewhere, oh, I don't know. We'll just say somewhere around here. So we'll say that's Leon's. So Mark 16, 9 through 20 makes its way up here. And Irenaeus has it in the early 2nd century. Okay, so Irenaeus. Boop. Okay, we can't read that. Let's just, let, we'll just say I for Irenaeus. Because I, I can't write with a mouse. Um, the reference in Justin wouldn't be contested if Metzger had not overlooked Harrison Chase after Kiaska's Arabic dietetics. Yes, I saw that. Um, so there was a publishing of the Dietessaron in 1888, which is shortly after uh, Westcott and Hort did their work. So um, it wasn't in there. Now, um, I didn't want to go too much into the de details because I do, don't have a full understanding of how that works. But um, the the uh, publishing of the Arabic Diatessaron um, proves a point that Justin Martyr was trying to make in this in this quotation. Um, so it solidified, at least for many, that what Justin Martyr was doing here was definitely alluding to the end of Mark. So um, I'll just say that there. I don't want to get too too far into the details. I'm going to start showing my ignorance if I do that. Okay, I'm, I'm not an expert. Um, but I happen to know a thing or two. So, um, so yeah, so we have Irenaeus up here in Lyon. So that's interesting. So we're still, you know, north of Rome. We'll, get, we'll keep that in mind. Now, Tatian. Tatian is an interesting discussion here because if you know anything about Tatian, he was the guy who sort of discovered the, well, not dis discovered, he didn't discover anything. He, he created the Diatessaron. Uh, so uh, most of us know what the Diatessaron is, but for those who don't, uh, in the uh, early centuries, I think it was probably in the hundreds, uh, early in the second century, um, Tatian cobbled together uh, all four Gospels and he kind of blended them all together to come up with a sort of Gospel harmony. And that ended up becoming quite influential in the Syriac church in the early centuries. It was replaced a little later by, um, I don't know if it was the, the Peshitta or um, the Herclan or, or one, one of the Syriac translations, but it, it eventually got replaced by like four. So, it, so for about 200 years, um, the Diatessaron was kind of like a de facto gospel for um, the Syriac-speaking people. Um, but anyway, so Tatian you would, includes in the Diatessaron uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20. Now, this is really interesting because if you follow the life of Tatian, what you find is Tatian ended up becoming, I would say, like a disciple of Justin, uh, Justin Martyr. Uh, and he ended up coming to Rome. So we've got um, Buddy... Uh, where's, where's this on the map? You know, I'm not going to draw an arrow there just because it's going to get pretty crazy. Yeah, 140, 150 ish. Um, so, so, uh, Tatian comes over and he creates the Diatessaron here while he's in Rome. Um, so we have the long ending of Mark in the Diatessaron here. And then presumably when he went off on his place, he took that over. Now, I, I don't know too much about what happened after Tatian, um, but he ended, I'm, I'm going to assume, I, I think it's safe to assume that he ended up back in Syria. Uh, nonetheless, <laughs> you can't even read that. Uh, let's make that bigger. So we have the diatessaron here. Diates. Okay, I need better software for this. Okay, we'll just put diatessaron there. Okay, so we've got three instances already uh, before the end of the second century um, of, of the long ending of Mark found Rome or, or north of Rome. Hippolytus apparently also uh, makes reference to the long ending of Mark. Now, I can't remember the date of Hippolytus. I didn't write him down, but these these are kind of the main guys here. Now, Codex Bobiensis is kind of like the next sort of thing to talk about. Now, no, it's a little bit later, but it's a Latin translation. I have a picture of it. Well, I don't have a picture of it, but I got a link to a picture of it. Let me uh, pop that up here just so you can see what I am talking about. Let's see. So Codex Bobiensis is right here, right at the bottom. 
Let's see if I can zoom that. There we go. So this is it. Codex Babiensis. This is apparently a third or fourth or fifth century uh, manuscript uh, in Latin. Uh, so this is a Latin translation of Greek. Uh, Hippolytus uh, 232. Yes. Uh, Irenaeus visited Rome in 177. I did not know that. I should add that to my notes. That's a very interesting point. So you, you can see the connection already in the first uh, two centuries of Rome. Um, M.A. Moreno says, I see it as a very early edition that is part of the canonical version of Mark, if not part of the first edition. Yeah, very interesting. Very good. And I think James's position is probably similar to that, uh, where someone else, uh, one of uh, Mark's friends, had uh, kind of finished off the manuscript before it was published and sent out. Uh, I don't know where I'm in, uh, where I am with that. I don't know if it came off the hand of Mark and he just kind of summarized at the end there or if he added it a little bit later before saying, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what exactly happened there. Uh, but anyway, coming back to Codex Bobiensis, this, this is where it gets really interesting. So Codex, Bob, Codex Bob, Bobiensis is a Latin translation uh, and it contains the ending of Mark, but in this specific instance, it just has the shorter ending and that's it. It doesn't have the long, doesn't have a 9 through 20, doesn't have, doesn't cut off at verse 8. It just has, you know, uh, the short ending. Um, so you would think, okay, well, this is cool. Uh, what's it doing in Rome? So if we come back to our map, let me just make sure I'm showing you that. Yeah, so if we come back to our, rap, our map, um, Bobbio is somewhere, I think, like up here. Um, so it's named Bobbiensis after the place where it's found. So you go, well, what's it doing in Rome if there's no ending on the end of Mark, if it's just the short ending? Why is it, why is it here? So you look at the history of the manuscript, and what you find is actually when it was translated, um, it was suggested that it was completed in Alexandria, now, I didn't get all the details. We'll just say Alexandria's here. So this is our first reference to... Um, this is so bad. It can't read that. But that's okay. We'll leave it there. Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to read that, actually, James. I think I snipped this from your book. Um, so, yeah, so it's in Alexandria. Some, some suggested it is Alexandria. And, and, the, and the interesting thing about Codex, Codex Bobiensis is that there, its text closely resembles what Cyprian um, was saying in his writing. So we come up here um, to Carthage. Okay, so Carthage is where uh, there seems to be some influence on this manuscript or vice versa. Uh, I don't know which way that that goes, whether Alexandria is influencing Carthage or whether Carthage is influencing Alexandria. I don't know. Um, but no, Babiens is not in Alexandria, but uh, apparently, yeah, apparently some have suggested that it was copied in Alexandria. Um, so I haven't, yeah, I haven't got there entirely yet. Um, so yeah, it, it, like James is saying in the comments there, it, it's likely or it's likely origination is Alexandria or or Carthage. Let me just write here, Carth. I gotta get better at this. Okay. Um, so what happened uh, was that it was originally penned. Uh, they would say four fifth century, um, somewhere south, somewhere on the other side of the uh, Mediterranean. And then a couple a couple hundred years later, it was brought up as a gift to to and it was held in a monastery in Babio. Um, so this, so it's not in Bobbio a reflection of a text in Rome. Um, it's a reflection of a text at least uh, south of the Mediterranean. Um, again, I, I don't know if Alexandria or Carthage or which way that influence is going, but definitely in the south is where we see this beginning to arise. Um, so now let me, uh, let me move on to the next one. Uh, so yeah, so James Snap. In his book on page 29, this is authentic, the case for Mark 69 through 20. It's a little bit of a lengthy um, writing, but he says this, um, and you can corroborate with me since you're in the comments here. Uh, Codex resembles a scene from the spurious gospel of Peter. <coughs> and it omits the part of the verse, uh, part of verse eight that mentions that the women said nothing to anyone. Even its presentation of the shorter ending contains mistakes that would embarrass any experienced copyist. For example, instead of writing from east to west, the copyist of Bobiensis wrote from east to east. And instead of writing Peter, Latin Petro, he wrote a child, <laughs> Piero. In Matthew 6.10, he mangled the Latin phrase, for thy kingdom come. Similar aberrations occur throughout the Codex, which now consists of only parts of Matthew and Mark. 
demonstrating that the copyist who made Codex Bibiensis was a rather incompetent copyist who was only slightly familiar with the material he was copying. The main thing to see, though, <coughs> is that Bobiensis does, does not enlarge the geographical range evidence for the abrupt ending at 16.8. Essentially, it keeps that within the, um, the, the North African Alexandrian area. Uh, so, Tregellis, um <laughs> Tregellis is so funny here. I, I read him, I, I think this is from a Bible, from the Bible researcher page, and this was just an opinion that Tregellis gave. And he's talking about this manuscript, which James Snap just, you know, owned hard, right? <laughs> anyway, Tregellis' opinion is it has great value, especially in places in which it supports the reading of a few of the best and oldest Greek manuscripts. Um, so, <sighs> Like you can see the bias in that. You can, you can totally see the bias, okay? I, I'm going to be up front here, right? I, I should have said this at the beginning of the video, but I, I believe Mark 16, 9 through 20 is, is original. I think we should keep it in the scriptures. I think it's an inspired word of God. Um, so I'm coming at this discussion from that angle, okay? But <laughs> the thing about the uh, uh, the the um, reasoned eclecticism, right? They, they try to portray this idea that it's a very like unbiased way of, uh, you know, the science of textual criticism trying to get in. And, and sure, that's all well and good, but clearly, clearly right here, right here in Tregellis' statement, it is great value, especially in places in which it supports the readings of a few of the best and oldest Greek manuscripts. So it's, so basically it's a garbage manuscript, except for when it comes to the readings that we like. I, I don't know how you could read that statement any other way. I, I know that might not sound very nice. I, I, just, I just don't know how you could read that any other way. Um, yeah, it's like Mark Twain said about Wagner. It's better than it sounds. Um, all right, let, let's see what the comments are. Uh, also, the textual tampering earlier in Mark chapter 16 should not be overlooked. Interpolations in Bobiensis in 16, 3 to 4 plus uh, verse 8 is truncated. Yeah, we touched on that. We quoted your book there. Uh, I'm not sure what the delay is here. Um, Covington Music, 100 to 199 Peshitta. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Oh, date, date, okay. Uh, Pastor Brett, amen. Uh, Covington Music, yes, Avidus Italia. That That is the, uh, I didn't touch on that. It's the old Latin, it's not the Vulgate. Um, it's the old Latin that we're seeing in Bobiensis. And I spelt it wrong in my notes, but that's okay. It's okay, you're not seeing my notes. All right, so we move on. We move on to Vaticanus, 4th century. I, I know we kind of took a little bit of a dip there, but I wanted to show that Bobiensis had a link to Alexandria and Carthage specifically, and the link to Cyprian, uh, who is much earlier than this manuscript is. So the general consensus, uh, I believe, when it comes to Bobiensis, is that, that it was copied from a 2nd century um, manuscript. Uh, at least it looks that way. So, um, so Bobiensis, uh, has the short ending, but it's geographically located south of the Mediterranean as opposed to north. So, so far in the north, what we're seeing is a witness to the long, uh, to, to the ending. I'm not going to say the long ending it's because it's the ending. Uh, so we see a witness to the ending in the north. Um, yeah. So, if we come down, the next one that we see is Vaticanus, which is uh, 350, uh, 350 AD, um, considered Egyptian. Uh, everybody knows what Vaticanus and Sinaiticus is, but uh, just, just briefly. Uh, it's considered Egyptian because it closely matches P75 in the Gospels. Um, so uh, P75, Papyrus 75, uh, these are all unearthed in Egypt. It's unquestionable. Uh, it, it's unquestioned, right? That everybody knows that the Papyrus manuscripts are in Egypt. They were copied in Egypt. They were found in Egypt. Uh, Oxyrhynchus was the big place where all that kind of stuff was found. Uh, people call it a trash heap. And I, I don't know if that's really true. I haven't looked into uh, that accusation before, uh, whether this was like just, you know, all these discarded manuscripts for whatever reason, or if they were just, I, I don't, I don't know what the exact um, reasoning is behind those papyri. Um, but one thing's for certain is that they were found in Egypt and they were um, copied in Egypt. Uh, I don't think anyone disputes that. Um, so when you have a text which matches stuff that's being pulled out of the ground in Egypt, uh, it very likely conforms to an Egyptian text base. And that's why we think Vaticanus is, uh, it, it shows an Egyptian text base. So when we say it's an Alexandrian text, right, referring to Alexandria in Egypt. Um, so Kenyon also argues that it was created in Alexandria, uh, Alexandria as per the ordering of the epistles, 
which matches the Sahidic versions. So the Sahidic version uh, has a specific order. I, I didn't write the order down, but there's a specific order that the epistles appear in in the Sahidic version, which is Coptic. It's, it's Egyptian, uh, like literal, like the language Egypt. It's, it's an Egyptian, uh, uh, Egyptian translation, Egyptian version. And so... Um, the ordering of the epistles in Vatican matches the Egyptian. So there's another sign that it's, it's copied in Egypt. Um, uh, Oxyrhynchus finds were indeed from the garbage dumps of this city. Uh, very cool. All right, Sinaiticus. Um, so let's, let's come back to our map here. Am I still showing the map? I am still showing the map. Look at that. Look at that. Okay, so let's come back to our map here. So at 350, 350. We have Codex Sinaiticus, and then we have Codex Vaticanus. Now I know one of them is slightly older than the other one. I think I think Sinaiticus is slightly older than Vaticanus. I think this is probably more like seventy-five, but of course we can't see that. <laughs> it's just, just just looks like a big mess. Let's get an eraser. Let's clear this up. No, oh, I'm taking up some of the map too. That's okay. So three, we'll say 370, yeah, 375, why not? Because that's, uh, I think that's Sinaiticus. And let me come back to my notes. So far, so, so far what we have is everything down here, okay? No ending, okay? Or short ending, okay, Bobby Enzis. Or short. There we go. And then everything up here contains the long ending. Okay, or the ending. Now, if we come back to the notes here, we start taking a look at the versions. So the ancient versions. So the first ancient version that I have listed here is the uh, the Gothic version. Uh, now I have a picture, a link to a picture that shows us the uh, Codex Argentis. Argentis, I think I said that right. Codex Argentis. Let me list that here. So we can look at it and go, ooh, ah. Uh, there we go. That's Codex Argentis. It's actually kind of a nice looking manuscript, if you ask me. Uh, so this is Gothic. Uh, now, I think it was uh, Gothic or was it Armenian? Some, someone made, a, made an alphabet specifically for the purpose of uh, writing the New Testament down. Um, but anyway, so, so this is the Gothic translation. And this was uh, produced by Bishop Wolfila. Uh, he brought Christianity to the Goths. And I think this happened so, uh, somewhere around uh, three or 400. Uh, and he produced a translated uh, a translation of the New Testament in the fourth century. And this is what we're looking at. And of course, when you look at where the, the Goths are, uh, let me uh, pull up the map here. Yeah, when you look at where they are, there's somewhere up around here. Okay, this is, some, this is where the Goths are, somewhere up here. So... Well, Phila uh, produces in 350, uh, th we'll see, let's say 350, uh, 4th century, so 350 is close to that. Um, notice that it's around the same time as Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. So it seems like they add the long ending because the Gothic manuscripts for the most part, actually I think all of them uh, have the long ending. Um, so you got the Goths here in the north and then in the south you have Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Um, so <laughs> they don't have it. <laughs> So it just gets really almost like obvious that there's a, a sharp distinction in the early centuries between those that are north of Rome and those that are south of Rome. Uh, so after the Goths, um, he, tra well, yeah, this, this is a point. I, I wasn't sure if the Gothic version was translated from Greek or Latin. Um, so I'm going to uh, go to one of the experts here in the, in the, um, in the comments here and see if maybe they know whether we'll fill a translated from Greek or Latin. That would be interesting to note. That could have been anything, especially being so close to Rome or at least, uh, you know, day's journey or so. Um, yeah, maybe it's similar to P75 because it's early. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a possibility. Um, but the issue that you have is you have references in the northern, northern part, uh, north of the Mediterranean, which, for example, have the Byzantine readings in Mark 16, 9 through 20. Um, so it, it could be, or it could be that something happened around Carthage or Alexandria. Um, and I, I haven't, uh, 
I have a theory. I'll, I'll throw that by you. Uh, in, in Carthage, there was some uh, very specific uh, persecution that was going on. Uh, I, I forget who it was. I think it was Decius. Uh, he basically forced the Christians there to sacrifice to um, other gods. And not only did he force them to sacrifice to other gods, he had them get a certificate that said that they did. Um, so a number of Christians in the early days, they falsified the certificates to show them. And then, of course, they weren't killed. And uh, some outright, you know, uh, Justin Martyr, uh, for example, I, I think it was Justin Martyr. It was around 200 AD. I, I'm getting the dates mixed up here. Um, but yeah, there were a couple who just didn't sacrifice at all, didn't falsify the tickets, and they just took the death penalty. Um, so there was tremendous um, persecution, uh, and this was this was up and up towards Carthage. And of course, this is where uh, you know a century later we get the Donatists, or not maybe not a century, but a number of years later we get the Donatists who come in and say, "Well, these guys who they falsified these certificates, and these guys who who gave up their books and stuff, well, they're not really Christians, and so they can't be Christians." And that there was a split there, which caused you know the Donatists to come out and say, "Well, we're the righteous ones because we went through the persecution and we dealt we dealt with it." Um, and of course there's, there's a link there, um, to the mark of the beast being 616 and 666. So go check my video out if you have a chance, but you can see in Carthage, um, specifically in Carthage, in North Africa. Um, I, I think, I personally think that 616 was a variant that developed there and was propagated by the Donatists. Um, so, you know, there's some stuff going on in the, in the Southern part, uh, South of the Mediterranean. Um, yeah, so. Anyway, so coming back to our map, um, we have uh, the Goths have the long ending. It's all well, it's all good. Um, and then we get the Coptics, the Sahedic manuscripts, which is some of the earliest Coptic manuscripts. So Egyptian. Um, I only found a reference to one Sahedic manuscript that did not have the long ending of Mark in it. Um, and it was dated somewhere around two or 300, somewhere around there. So we have one Egyptian manuscript without the long ending um, here. And this is definitely, uh, if it wasn't in Alexandria, it's going to be along the Nile there for sure, for sure. Um, so the Sahedic manuscript doesn't, doesn't have it. Um, but then in the third or fourth century, the Sahedic was replaced by the Bohiric manuscripts, which is just another dialect of Egyptian. And uh, essentially all the Bohiric manuscripts contain the long ending of Mark. Um, so they made a choice or a decision um, at that point to begin accepting the long ending of Mark in Egypt. So it didn't take long for that to happen. Um, if this is all correct. Um, now we come to... My notes are almost ending here. Uh, there is, as far as I know, only one Sahedic manuscript of Mark that stops at 16.8. Yeah. Yeah. So even, even in this part where we're seeing long ending issues, um, there's not many. There just isn't many, even among the, amongst the translations. Now, where it gets interesting, this, this is so cool. This is so cool. Where it gets interesting is when you come around uh, the Mediterranean Sea, Okay, this is Byzantium. Okay, this, this is where later on, later on, all of the Byzantine manuscripts come from. Um, but you come later on down here. So we travel and north meets south, okay, over here. And we come to Caesarea. And this is where the Syriac uh, would have been translated. And the Syriac is really interesting because this is where you start really seeing in the translations where... Uh, there's a bit of variance on whether or not the manuscripts contain um, contain the long ending or not. Um, so the interesting thing, though, is the earliest versions of the Syriac, the, the Kyrtonian manuscripts, the old Syriac, um, the Peshit and the Herclean, for the most part, have the long ending, uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20. There's a tradition, the Sinaitic Syriac did not contain uh, that. So now we're talking about 4th, 5th century here. Uh, when we're talking about these Syriac editions. And this is where it starts getting kind of mixed and muddled. Yeah, you can say down here it's mixed and muddled a bit, but it seems like it's propagating south. I, that's just my, my hunch. Now, you take that a step further, and up here, I, my map's not quite big enough. This is uh, Armenia and Georgia. Now, James Snap, who's in here, I was going to say that's Arm, and this is George where they, where they kind of meet <laughs> the traditions here. Um, these versions um, 
our our mix with 50 percent of the Armenian manuscripts uh, being with the long ending and fifty percent of them being without. I think there was like two hundred manuscripts and like ninety nine didn't have it and one hundred one had or so, something like that. Um, uh, exactly one extant Syriac manuscript does not support Mark sixteen. The weirdo Sinaitic Syriac manuscript. Nice. Um, now. The history surrounding the Georgian and the Armenian manuscripts here uh, is rather complicated. So rather than just try to figure it out and sort it all out in front of everybody, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quote James Snap again um, because he did this wonderful write-up on Facebook when I was asking some questions. So I'm just going to read uh, what he says here. All right, he puts, Dwayne Green. To gain an adequate appreciation of... You know what? Let me just put it up here. You guys can read that. Yes, I, I snipped it, James. I snipped it. Uh, so he puts... <clears throat> to gain an adequate appreciation of all the factors that contributed to the production of the Armenian version, read A.E. Breen's description of the origins of the Armenian version, shown here in a condensed and edited form. The evangelization of Armenia was undertaken by Gregory the Illuminator in the first years of the 300s. For more than a century, the Armenians had no proper version of scripture nor liturgy. They made use of the Syriac text. When Isaac became patriarch, 390 to 440, Saint Mesrop, his co-laborer, resolved to invent an alphabet. That's right. Uh, Cyrillic it was also an invented uh, in this, this Slavonic stuff. Um, in 406, he perfected an alphabet of 36 letters with the aid of his principal disciples, John uh, Egugiatz and Joseph Begin. He undertook a translation of the Old and New Testament. This work was finished in 411 and was based on the Syriac because no one possessed the Greek text and because Syriac had become for many Armenians the language used in the liturgy. Yeah, I, I realize that. I just see James, he was semi-quoting A.E. Breen. He's just summarizing and, and he says that in the comments. So he's just summarizing. Uh, so some years later, Isaac and Mesrop sent John Bagan and Esnik, uh, another of their disciples, to Edessa, that they might translate the Holy Scriptures from Syriac into Armenian. From Edessa, they went to Byzantium, where they were joined by other disciples of Mesrop, including uh, Goriam, Mesrop's biographer. Uh, they were still there at the time of the Council of, uh, of Ephesus. Their labors ended. They returned to Armenia carrying among their literary effects the acts of the council and authentic copies of the holy scriptures in greek so this is why we see the division in the armenian in, in the armenian um tradition one because the first ones were based off of these syriac manuscripts and then the second ones came back with more authentic copies of the greek text uh, so isaac and mesrop immediately sought to turn these latter to good account and retouch the old version made from the syriac by exactly comparing it with the authentic copies that had been brought to them but the translators uh, who worked under their orders did not have a sufficient knowledge of the Greek language and their labor was judged very imperfect. They therefore sent other young men to study Greek at Alexandria. Moses of Corinne was among this number. They doubtless uh, brought back from Egypt other Greek exemplars of the Bible, which they used to perfect the work of their predecessors in faithfully translating the text of the Septuagint from the Hexapla of Origin, the same signs and asterisks used in the Hexapla and found in the old Arminian manuscripts of the Bible. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, so Esnick and Gold quoted Mark 16, 17 to 19, probably using the Syriac diatessaron. Yeah, there you go. That's a quote from James in the, in the uh, comments there. Uh, now, now, when it comes to the Georgian manuscripts, uh, the one factor uh, up here <laughs> in the far north, uh, the one factor uh, uh, considering the Georgian manuscript is that they're not necessarily an independent witness of the ending of Mark um, because from what I understand, uh, they were influenced and possibly used. The oh, wait, we disconnected. Let's see what's going on here. I think reconnect. There we go. All right. I'm not sure what everybody missed there. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have some bad weather right now. So we have Starlink internet. So when the weather is bad, we get poor signal. And there's a potential that the power might go out. And if that's the case, if that's the case, it'll just go dark. And I've got everything else on battery power. So we're good. I got about two hours of internet if the, ba if the, if the power goes out. So we're good. Um, but yeah, so if I come back here, let's zoom out. <laughs> you you kind of get the picture. The earliest references that we have, the earliest references that we have of the long ending, of the ending, 
come from Rome, if we assume that it was written there in Rome, and we see Irenaeus in Leon's, and we see the Gothic community take the long ending without question, we see Justin Martyr, uh, we see Hippolytus uh, later on, uh, you, nobody's, nobody is saying of Mark 69 through 20, whoa, 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 what's this? What's, what's this? There, there, there's no, um, there's no questioning it in the early centuries. It's not until you come into the later centuries when people, um, in other parts of the Roman world start to question. So like in Caesarea where Eusebius is, is, uh, presiding and he's writing all this stuff. He's starting to say, well, you know, not many manuscripts have it. And then, and then of course you've got, uh, Jerome, who apparently said, you know, there's no manuscripts, no Greek with, with it. Uh, yet he, he produces it in his Vulgate anyway. Um, so you, you typically don't see any discussion about its authentic, uh, authenticity until later. Um, so you, so are we confirming the reading? Curiso Moose. So we are, conf yes. You missed the first part of the discussion there. Uh, Curiso Moose. Um, so I'm coming from the position that Mark 16, 9 through 20 is original. And this, this is confirming this, this splotch of stuff here that you can barely read. <laughs> That's me confirming it. Um, anyway, so th there's a definite pattern to it coming south. Uh, sorry, there, there's a definite pattern um, from the north moving east as far as the manuscript tradition shows the long ending of Mark. And then the south moving east, and then they end up here where all the confusion happens. Um, so, I mean, there's some confusion down here, but that's to be um, that's to be expected when they're introducing a, a newer reading. Now, there was something other interesting about Codex Bobiensis that I wanted to mention. Let me come back up here. I don't know if I remember what that was. Uh... I don't remember what that was. There was another interesting tidbit of information of Codex Bobiensis, but um, we'll just leave it there. Yeah, so yeah, summarizing again. Um, yeah, it looks like the confusion was was seen here um, probably around the 3rd to 4th century. That's when we start seeing this, oh, I don't know what to do with this. And I think what's happening here is that the doubt produced in either Carthage or Alexandria, um, yeah, with Cyprian and... and uh, Bobby ends. This makes me think potentially it came from there. I don't know. Uh, Carthage is a port city. Alexandria is a port city. Rome is a port city. And then Antioch, uh, which is over here. And there was one other, Caesarea. They're both port cities. So anyone could make a travel, right, by boat to any of these. And the question is, is what what's someone more likely to do back in that day and age? Are they going to travel via boat um, to a port city? Or is it more convenient, convenient cheaper? Um, to, to walk or to take your horse drawn carriage or whatever it is. Right. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know. These are, these are questions that I would like to, you know, ask and figure out like, did, did, did this reading move along with the propagation of manuscripts, um, through a land route? Was it easier for them to walk the lands and to go, or did they take them on their boats? How many times would somebody take something on the boat and, uh, hand it down? Uh, how often would people carry their manuscripts across land? Like if they're traveling from school to school. Um, so if it's more convenient to travel on land, um, that's a long trek, right? That's going to take a long time. You you got days, days, maybe even weeks worth of journey. Um, so is somebody going to spend days or weeks worth of journeys going back, um, trying to check their manuscript from Caesarea in Rome? Uh, I, I suppose somebody could send a... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you, you could send a messenger to, uh, to find out. But again, it's really inconvenient. It's not like you can just text somebody and say, here you go. Um, so I think when we look at the geographical spread and what's happening through the ages as time goes on, um, it just seems that the north-south distinction is happening here um, with the long ending of Mark. Everything north is is good for the long ending. Everything south, right? Uh, went south. <laughs> That's funny. It went south. That's right, NKJV. There we go. Um, yeah. So, but but it's cool though because although you see in in the north or in the south, right? You know what? Can I clear all this out? Yeah, let's clear all this out. Everything that you see in the south when it comes to the readings of the long ending, it's mixed. It's a mixed bag. Uh, so, for example, 
the Coptic version has both it and not, right? It has a long ending and it doesn't have the long ending. We have Latin manuscript, which has a long ending and doesn't have the long ending, though most, almost all the Latin has it uh, for sure. Um, you see the papyrus, which don't have it, and sometimes they do. Uh, well, I don't know if the papyrus has both, um, but nonetheless, you, you see instances where both the long ending is down here in the south, but then when you go to the north, you see the long ending, but you don't see any instances where there's not the long ending. Um, so there seems to be an eastward track uh, towards this. And then, of course, the massive confusion happens here. And this is where you begin to start seeing the debates as to whether or not this is actually scripture or not. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, again, I'm not entirely an expert. I'm just learning things as I go. And I just kind of got the... Um, uh, what do you call it? The head check that says, you know, I got to look into church history a little bit more. Um, but yeah, when it, when it boils down to it, it really looks like uh, that's, that's the direction it took. So um, again, this is all assuming that Mark wrote his gospel in Rome. Um, so if Mark, in fact, did write his gospel in Rome, um, then this makes sense. That I think this makes sense. Um, but if he didn't, if he wrote it in uh, Syria, uh, or if he wrote it in Alexandria, apparently Mark became um, the, uh, what do you call it, the, the bishop in Alexandria in the, in the end of the first century. Um, so maybe if he wrote it there in Alexandria, then, um, then this doesn't, this theory doesn't work out at all. Um, so let me, uh, I'm just going to take a look at the comments. I know there's tons going by here. Let me uh, <coughs> trade view. I'm sure you don't want to look at my scribbles anymore. Uh, what have we got going on here? Just checking on the stream. All right. There we go. Um, all right. Where was it? Comments. We're going to take a look at some of the comments. All right. Alexandria <clears throat> is the epicenter of the abrupt ending at 16.8. Could very well be. Yeah. Uh, James, you're the expert. I don't know. I, th I think Carthage might have something to do with that too. I, I don't know. Uh, but, um, and the only, the only reason why I'm suggesting Carthage is because uh, in my own study of what happened with 666 and 616. So we all know the variant. Dan Wallace made it popular and said, oh, you know, maybe it's 616. I, I think he's in error for saying that, to be honest. Um, but when I tracked it down, it ended up becoming something that was found in Carthage, in North Africa, and then propagated um, <clears throat> by the Donatists. And there were a couple, uh, a couple early commentaries which made their way through the rest of the um, Roman Empire through the ages. Um, but they were just kind of peppered here and there, sprinkled, sprinkled here and there. Um, but yeah, so obviously something happened in Carthage, and 616 and 666 got kind of swapped out in a few manuscripts or something like that. Um, and of course the, uh, the persecution there, uh, could possibly have seen some damage to some manuscripts or, or the destruction of some manuscripts there and kind of left a hole in the understanding in the Southern part. I, I know we always talk about East and West when it comes to manuscripts, right? The, the West and the East and, and all that, and the kingdom and all that. But, uh, but I'm, I'm making a distinction here between the North and the South because I think, uh, given what we're seeing here, that's what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> we have quite a bit of evidence for significant boat transport rather than road. Yeah, you you shared with me a number of uh, resources on on the NT textual criticism page, so I'm gonna probably take a look at that. Um, uh, James Snap, Eternal Logic. Try the W E B uh, and the E O B New Testament, please. Yes, James. James has been trying to convince me uh, of the E O B for some time. I've, I've yet to look into that. So at some point, at some point, I probably will. I probably will. Uh, Lectionary sixteen o two tells the history of the Egyptian text of Mark sixteen in a nutshell. I saw references to Lectionary sixteen o two when I was looking at this. Um, it, it would be interesting to dive into that a little more. You know, what? in fact, I'm going to write it on my piece of paper, L1602, there we go. Um, <clears throat> I've heard of the web, not familiar with the other one. You know what, I can change this too, can't I? Let me just, you guys don't want to look at my map anymore, do you? Oh, I must be far behind. Okay, all right, I'm good. Um, 
Hello from Spain. Do you think that there was a first and second edition of the Gospel of Mark? Um, if there was, uh, nobody's recorded it. Alexandria was sick of all the Appalachian snake handlers, hence its omission. Nice. Uh, but Irenaeus talks about it before the rise of Donatism. Yes, he, he does talk about it before the rise of Donatism. Um, I didn't say it originated with the Donatism, but it was propagated by the Donatists. Um, Heffin Jones by about 70 to 80 years. Yes. Uh, it, 666-616. I'm missing something there. He also coins a version of the oldest and best line. Interesting. What quote is that, Heffin? I don't know how far behind you are. Uh, if I'm just getting the 616 stuff now, uh, you're probably a good minute or two behind. Um, so I'll leave that there. Now, what would be interesting to talk about is um, the uh, preservation of Mark 16, 9 through 20. Um, so we have it essentially um, throughout the entire known history of the church. Uh, we, we have it all the way back, all the way back. As, as far as we can get any information on it, we have the long ending of Mark. Um, and today, when you when you bring the long ending of Mark into the, the reasoned eclectic method, and the work that was done since Tregellis and, and Westcott and Hort in the 1800s, they've casted significant doubt on whether or not Mark 16, 9 through 20 is scripture or not. Uh, again, I'm, I'm of the opinion that it is. And so that doubt comes through some other scholars, uh, makes its way through Metzger, and then into today's modern uh, scholastic camp, right? In, into modern academia. And many, 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 many textual critics would look at Mark 16, 9 through 20 and conclude that it's not scripture. Uh, so like this, not just a few, I, I think the majority even um, are, are on that train. Uh, the Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not scripture. Now, I'm, I'm not here to reference them personally or just, or bring any personal attacks. I'm, I'm not, I try to stay away from that kind of stuff. Um, but it's interesting to me, like like John MacArthur, for example, preaches a whole sermon about why, you know, it stops at verse 8 and it's perfect ending and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, it's impacting it's impacting the way we preach our messages, right? When you come to Mark 16, 9 through 20, how are you going to preach it? Um, John MacArthur chose to excise it and to just ignore it. Uh, I, I don't know if he entirely ignored it, but but you know what I mean? He just chose to say, well, inspiration stops here at the end of verse 8. And he, he preached that way. Now, when I come to Mark 16, 9 through 20, of course I'm going to preach through it because I believe it's scripture. Um, but yeah, so on, anyway, on, on the preservation train, it's interesting to me that even though um, it's becoming uh, sort of the popular thing uh, to reject Mark 16, 9 through 20, it's always done just in word, okay? It's, o it's only rejected in word. Um, you'll get the scholars say, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's original. Um, Dan Wallace, I believe, doesn't think it's original. I don't believe James White thinks it's original. Uh, a number of, of um, very scholastic academic people don't think it's original. And yet, and yet, the critical text still contains Mark 16, 9 through 20 in the scriptures. So if, if I add an element of preservation into this discussion, and th this is why I'm a Byzantine guy, is because I think you can take that element of preser preservation and apply it to the Byzantine text better than you can an eclectic text. Um, when you apply that, you think to yourself, you go, oh, look, even though modern academia is rejecting it, for the most part, and I'm not speaking for everybody, but even though modern academia rejects it, it still finds their way in our Bibles, right? You can pull a critical text Bible off the shelf, your New American Standard Bible. Now, they'll put brackets around it. They will put brackets around it. But nonetheless, it's in the body of the text. It, it, it's funny because for for the regular Joe, right, who who has their English Bible, they love the Lord, they're reading it, they're, they're being fed by it. They come to those brackets in Mark 16 and they have no idea. They have no idea what it means. I recently had a conversation with somebody who loves their NASB uh, and, and uh, we were talking about Mark 16, 9 through 20 and I was just telling him, you know, we, we got to keep it in the screen. He had no idea what he's talking about. And uh, he said, oh, it's in my Bible. It's in the NASB. And so when he showed it to me, it's, you know, you could see the little square brackets there to say that, you know, the editors don't think that this is original uh, and yet it's in the text. But my point is they don't know what that means. When, when a regular Joe looks at that and sees those brackets in there, they don't know what that means. They don't know that it means that, you know, this might not be scripture. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what to make of that. It's just a really interesting um, 
I, I don't know. I, I could say that there's an element of preservation in that. Um, from against heresies. Yeah, I'm going I'm to go back and look at that, Heaven. Uh, James, the quote is from Irenaeus against heresies, book five. Yes, I, I, I'll have to go back to my video and take a look. Um, I, uh, I don't write as much as you guys do. Uh, my medium is the videos. Uh, so may, maybe I'll get into writing. I don't know. I got some ideas, but, um, so the Catholic view, uh, is that it was a later edition, but it's still part of the Bible because we say so. <laughs> yes. Well, it was in the, it was in the Latin Vulgate, right? Uh, heaven, there are lots of poor arguments used against 920. Yes, I'm sure there's lots of poor arguments used for uh, 920. I'm hoping this is not a poor argument. <laughs> what do you think, Heaven? Is this is this a poor argument that I presented today? Um, I wouldn't say it was an argument, though. I think it was just more some observations I've made. Uh, Pastor Brett, he sent me a special edition a while back. Lots of notes, too many for me. Who sent you a special edition? I missed I missed something there. A Hannah 16, 9 to 20 seems consistent, consistent with the actions of the 12 apostles going into the beginning of Acts. It seems to be the protocol for what was happening then. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think those uh, who would reject 16, 9 to 20 on internal grounds would say something along the lines of, well, it was cobbled together from a bunch of stories from Acts and, and the Gospels, uh, or uh, mostly the Acts. Um. Protestants tried removing it in 1946 RSV, but Catholics put it back in with the RSV CE of 1966 and Protestants caved with the 1971 RSV. Huh. Nice tool for discussion. Yes, I'd, I'd like to get a better one. Um, you can't, he, nobody could read anything as I was trying to type it out there. Uh, Dwayne, were you going to also cover the Georgian version? Um, I didn't have a tremendous amount of notes on the Georgian version. It, it got a little bit complicated there. It would be worthwhile to come back and do another video specifically on that because there's, um, from what I understand, and this is just like top level uh, reading of the Georgian version, is that it took most of its inspiration, for lack of a better word, um, from the Armenian uh, language manuscripts and not so much from the original Greek. Now, I don't know how true that is, but my understanding is that the uh, Georgian manuscripts are more of a witness to the Armenian translation than they are to the original text. Um, but yeah, you'll, um, I'm sure you'll either correct that or whatever it is in the comments there. Um, so Heaven Jones, yeah, geography, not especially convincing one way or another. That's a very kind way to say that is a poor argument. <laughs> Love you, bro. Um, KWPC Tech. Howdy, everyone. Uh, the number of manuscripts without it are pretty... Yes. Okay. I, I do have... I, I, I can concede that uh, for your sake, Heaven. So uh, you just linked something off in my mind here. So one of my critiques of the, uh, the eclectic method um, and their reliance on kind of, you know, older is better. I, I know that's a generalization. Uh, but was when I looked at 1 Timothy 3.16... And specifically, I noted Metzger's phrase in his commentary where he suggests, you know, um, all the manuscripts, all, all the great, un or all the unseals before the 6th century are not a witness to so, so, something to that effect. And I remember looking at it. And when I, when I looked at the witnesses, it turned out there were only five witnesses out of the entire New Testament corpus, um, out of everything from the early, I think it was even from the 9th century and before, I can't remember. It was, it was uh, quite, quite a time frame. Uh, there were only five witnesses. Um, one was a strange reading. It was to which or ho, uh, I think that was, uh, Ephraim Rescriptus. No, it wasn't Ephraim Rescriptus. It, it was some, some unseal, uh, random number unseal is 061 or something. Uh, 061. That's what it was. And then you had a Ephraim Rescriptus, uh, which had, a, um, was it? I can't remember who, what, what, what was what. I know Vaticanus, um, it was the Sinaiticus Vaticanus had uh, ho, ho uh, he who, um, but then it was corrected to God who, and then another one was ho, which was corrected to God who. I think it was Codex of Framing Rescriptus. Alexandrinus was in there, and it was corrected from ho to, um, uh, to um, uh, he who to God who. Uh, it was corrected later. Anyway, so there were, there were five manuscripts. Two of them had the same sort of thing going on. One had its own reading, and then another one, another two had their own reading. And it was just five manuscripts. So this is a long-winded way of me saying, and this is why I don't do live, well, I haven't done a whole lot of live streams, is because I, I need to sort the stuff out in my head. I can't come up with it all on the spot like that. Um, but it's a long-winded way of me saying, that's not enough data 
to really determine uh, five manuscripts uh, on, on that. Yeah, it's, it's not enough data to really determine uh, whether or not, you know, we should go with this reading or that reading. Now, I know there's some stuff to be said about the, the early church fathers and some of the versional information and stuff like that. But, but yeah, I, I, oftentimes you run into situations where um, there just isn't enough information in the early manuscripts to say, uh, to, to make that kind of decision. So uh, again, when it comes to Byzantine priority, well, we've got the safety in numbers, right? Um, so let's come back here. James White is still hiding from me. My offer to debate him, Mark 16, 9 to 20, has stood ever since 2019. Yes, I had almost, I'd almost made that work. That would have been so cool to have you, James, and the other James, James and James, James versus James. Um, but uh, I, I called his ministry. I said, listen, I want to see this debate. Come on and do the debate. And I, I never heard back. I, I think I called twice, um, but that would have been really, that would have been really good. I would happily host that. I would want to see that, a front line, front row ticket to James and James. Uh, so Pastor Brett, he now believes it belongs. <coughs> Who does, James White? James White believes that Mark 16, 9 through 20 belongs? That would be interesting. I know there was some confusion uh, surrounding James White and his position, but it turned out to be... Um, it turned out to be a passage in Mark chapter 1, actually. Um, I remember th watching... I was watching a video from him once, and I was like, what? James is for the long ending now? And it turned out that it was... Uh, I forget which variant was it, Son of God in Mark 1, 1. Um, but yeah, that was, I, I remember posting that too. And I was like, oh, James is here. James is here. And then I had to retract that. <laughs> and he had egg in my face. Um, all right. Vaticanus with blank space, Sinaiticus. Yes. Yeah. Um, James White is still. Yeah. So anyway, if, if that opportunity does happen, I would love to see you two debate. Um, so Pastor Brett, he now believes it belongs. I'm waiting for you to answer. So he believes, okay, you, you got you to gotta put a link in there, okay? Pictures or it didn't happen. <laughs> I would love to see um, if James White still, yeah, if, if you got a link, I want to see it. I want to see it. I, I haven't seen that come from him. Um, I heard him say it was in E D E C G B C G M. East, yeah, okay. Um, I also talked to Rich Pierce, uh, Mark 69 through still excluded from ECM. Yes, it is. Bring your A game, James White. It's the challenge. It's the challenge. Uh, yes, ECM, also CBGM. Uh, Mark 69 through 20 is not considered original in ECM. It is a B reading, not an A reading. They do explore the variants. Yeah, Pastor Brett, documentation, please. I'm with James in this one. We need to see a link. We need to see a link, brother. Man, if you have a link of Dr. James White saying Mark 16, 9 through 20 is original, that would be amazing. And then, of course, I'll reach out to him again and see if he wants to come on the channel and talk about it. Um, all right, so let's 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 take a look at Mark 16, 9 through 20. Um, I don't know, my English Bible down here. Uh, I'll just pull it up on the computer. Because I think there's a reason why some people like to say that it's not scripture. I'm going to make it a possibility because I don't want to implore any bad, um, what's the term? Uh, bad motives on the people who don't think it's scripture. Um, but it does have a convenient factor when you leave it out. Uh, let's take a look. Mark 16, 9 through 20. Oh, you can see I've been doing searches. Let's do NKJV, just because I like the NKJV and I'm driving. Uh, Bible Hub. I like Bible Hub too. <clears throat> now, I know that some of you in the chat are cessationists. Okay, Yes, I'm bringing that conversation to this. And some of you are continuationists. Uh, so when we come to Mark 16... I think it pretty clearly gives us an indication of a continuationist um, doctrine, if you will. Um, so 
if we come here and we read what Jesus says to the disciples, he says, uh, verse 15, let me make that bigger. That way we can all enjoy the scriptures together. Uh, <clears throat> there we go. Am I showing the right screen here? Ah, I'm behind here. That nah, makes sense. Let me go like that. There we go. Still getting some of the live stream stuff sorted out. All right. <coughs> All right. Yes. So I have seen cessationists who love Mark 16, 9 through 20. Of course we love Mark 16, 9 through 20. Um, I would be curious to hear... A, 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 um, Oh, I wait, I totally misspoke. That's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> I'm a continuationist who loves Mark 16, 9 through 20. You almost had me there, Heaven. You almost had me there. Uh, I would be curious to hear um, a, a cessationist interpretation of this passage. Um, so anyway, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, speaking to the disciples. Um, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Okay, that's one point there, an interesting doctrinal point that seems to be seems to be um, specific to this passage. And then, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe, those who believe. It doesn't say the disciples. It doesn't say, um, you know, uh, Peter, James, and John. It says those who believe. Uh, in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Of course, the retort is going to be, well, then go drink this cup of antifreeze, right? There was a big debate with uh, Jeff Durbin, James White, and I forget who the guy was, but he was totally unhinged and brought some antifreeze and made fun of them and tried to get them to drink it. He's going to do what Porphyry did. Uh, porf porfer, <laughs> who apparently made fun of Christians again in the third century about you know, why don't you just go drink poison? Uh, so, some more long-ending uh, evidences. Uh, there was another uh, another guy, Star with the C, can't remember his name. He, he was also mocking Christians for the long-ending of Mark in the third century. So that was making the rounds. Um, anyway, so, yeah, so as a, as a continuationist, I, I this is great, right? Uh, those who believe will do these acts, right? Uh, so I, I think when it comes to uh, cessationism, uh, I'm sure there are some cessation, I, I mean, who believe Mark is original, but we'll explain this away. Um, Pastor Brett, I know you are a cessationist. I'd be curious to hear your opinion on this. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would see this as clear evidence uh, of my continuationist leaning, uh, of the continuationist cause, um, so to speak, because it, it's pretty clear. Those who believe will do these things, and there's no time frame on that. There's nothing to do with canon of scripture. There's nothing to do with the cessation of the gifts here. Um, it's just this, these, these are the things that are going to be expected in the life of believers. So I, I see that um, as, as good, as good, right? So when it comes to um, cessationists like John MacArthur, um, you know, I, again, I don't want to impute bad motives to him, um, but it's hard to like, oh, Pastor Brett, you're a continuationist. Well, amen, brother. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to think that, you know, by saying it's not original makes it very convenient, um, to deal with a passage like this, uh, when it's opposed to your own theological views. And when I think of that, I, you know, uh, Philip Payne comes to mind, uh, when it comes to women in ministry and taking first Corinthians 14 and, and, you know, finding all this research to cut that passage out of the Bible entirely. Now, I, I think I talked a little bit about that in the last live stream at very, very dangerous place to be. Um, when you're suggesting that we should just cut things out of the Bible in order to fit my theological position, uh, I'm sure Dr. Payne doesn't think he's doing that. Um, but I mean, it's a question that you have to ask is, is your bias influencing your decision here? Uh, which in this live stream is the reason why I started off by saying, you know what? I believe Mark 16, nine through 20 is original. Um, I don't know if I would have to have said that cause I think everybody is here pretty much knows where I stand on the issue. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, that, that, that's a valid question. How, how biased are, you know, are your, the how, how much of an impact are your theological positions having on your decisions here? Um, so yeah. Uh, let's see comments. Brother, brother Brett, pastor Brett, you are a continuationist. Very good. Very good. You're on the right side of the discussion. 
<laughs> Deborah, I will have to look into that. I used to have a Mac study Bible, but got rid of it. I thought it was like NKJV or maybe NIV. Yeah, I think I think the uh, Johnny Mac study Bible comes in both. Um, he does an interesting thing too with 1 Corinthians 14 too. Uh, he who speaks uh, in a tongue speaks to God. Um, he takes the translation idea that um, it's not, he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks to God. He says, you speak to a God. Uh, and you read that in his commentary. I remember one day I walked into the Christian bookstore and I saw it there and I just happened to flip over and see that. I was like, oh, interesting. And of course, the first thought in my head is, well, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses tried that trick too. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, he's not a Jehovah Witness, okay? I, I, I just, I think it's interesting just the way that it's changed. I, I don't think there's anyone else that I've seen that suggested 1 Corinthians 14 too. We should have a God there. Uh, so, Anyway, is that a question of his theological leaning, um, pouring into that text specifically? And is it uh, the same thing with the long ending of Mark as his theological leaning helping, informing his um, question of those last verses in the Gospel of Mark? Um, <clears throat> Uh, M.A. Moreno, I tried thinking like a continuationist, but ended once <laughs> I finished the New Testament. So it ceased, eh? It ceased. <laughs> it's okay, Brother Moreno. Um, James Snap, notice Augustine's embrace of Mark 16, 9 through 20 in Hippo, circa 400. Yes, yes. Uh, where was Augustine, uh, where was he bishop again? Um, he wasn't in Alexandria, was he? I keep, was he in Rome? I think he was in Rome. Um... Yeah, and, and uh, oh, Hippo, Hippo. Oh, what is wrong with me? It's too early. Yeah. Um, where is Hippo geographically? I don't even know where that is. Let's take a look. Hippo Regius is an ancient name for modern city of Enaba, Algeria. North Africa. Okay. Oh, yeah, North Africa. Look at that. Augustine of Hippo near Carthage. Yeah, okay. Very good. That's just lending credence, heaven, uh, to my theory. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Hannah, I am a cessationist as well that believes Mark 16, 9 through 20. Look at 2 Tim 4.20, Philippians 2.26, 28, 1 Tim 5.23, or 1 Corinthians 1.17. Hmm. I am a cessation as well, that believes. Oh, okay, I see. Let's let's take a look. Let's let's go to to Tim. Let's just pick one of your random passages here to see what you're saying. Oh, oh to Tim. To Tim four twenty. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but uh, Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Yes, I, I don't have an issue with that. Um, just because the uh, the gifts of the Spirit operate today does not mean that everybody is going to get healed of everything. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see an issue with that at all. Um, I mean, sounds like some of the other passages you have are going to be similar along those lines. First Timothy five twenty three. Da, da, da. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach. Say, yeah, again, same thing. Um, I I don't think this is necessarily like a, a the death knell for uh, continuationism. Again, uh, ultimately, we, I I can't speak for all continuationists, but. It, it's not in the person. The gift of healing is not in the person themselves. It's, it's the Holy Spirit who provides the gift of healing through that person. Um, that, that's how I see it. Um, so if the Holy Spirit doesn't want to heal somebody, then that person's not going to get healed. And, you know, I try to avoid all this discussion about, oh, you know, it's, you didn't get healed. It's your own fault. You got sin in your life. I mean, you know, I'm sure everybody who has <laughs> sinned, at, everybody has sinned at one point. So that that's not an argument. Of course, you have Jesus talking about those whom the tower fell on, right? Who, who sinned, him or his parent, like, you know, all these things. So anyway, um, all right. Ha ha ha, I'm a continuationist who leans toward not believing in Mark's long ending. Well, yes, there you go, <laughs> Deborah. Very good. Well, I mean, it'd be better if you believe the long ending. That's okay. Uh, exact opposite of you guys. Um, so Reg Taylor, the idea, is it in the Bible, not in the Bible, makes it unreliable. Why do you all think the inerrancy of Scripture is valid? 
The Alexandrians didn't believe in it, and the Bible can be improved. Uh, I'm just trying to think what you're saying. The, the idea, is it in the Bible? Not in the Bible. Makes it unreliable. Sorry, what, what, what makes that unreliable? Asking the question if it's in the Bible? Um, why do you all think inerrancy of Scripture is valid? Um, it's the basis of our faith. Uh, absolutely, it's the basis of our faith. Um, God provided written word. The Alexandrians didn't believe in it, and the Bible can be improved. Improved in what way? Uh, that would be an interesting question. And how do you know the Alexandrians didn't believe in it? Uh, my understanding is Origen specifically had a very, um, very interesting way of looking at the scripture. Uh, he didn't see it as a literal thing, but more of a, a allegory. He took more of an allegorical approach to to interpreting scripture. I don't think that that's the same as saying they didn't believe in it. Uh, at least that's where I would get with, with your comments there. Um, so Deborah asks, why continuationist or why not long ending? <laughs> I'll let you guys duke that out in the comments. Uh, verse 17 and 18 are exactly what happened in the book of Acts. So no contradictions. No, no, none at all. Um, Reg Taylor, I just joined late. So maybe everyone else gets it, but I don't understand their argument. That's okay, Deborah. I don't understand uh, what he is saying either. Uh, so hopefully he will have seen this if he is up to date on the live stream and he will give us a little bit more, a little bit more context surrounding his question there. Um, yeah, so anyway, let me come back here. I think we've been on for a good amount of time here. Let me take a look. Oh, my clock is all messed up here. It's not two in the morning. It's definitely not two in the morning. I'm Easter time zone. It's probably going to be closer to 10 would be my guess. So we've been on here for just over an hour. Um, I think that's pretty much all that I have for uh, for today. Um, unless someone has any more questions in there, I think, um, I think we're pretty much done here. Uh, so I will give another 30 seconds or so. And if any more comments happen to come up, I will do my best to answer your questions. Um, in the meantime, if you want... Okay, if you like my drawing, <laughs> if you like my drawing, I can send you the bitmap file or the JPEG and you can frame this and put it on your wall and say, there it is, the evidence of Mark 16, 9 through 20. Okay, I'm just kidding. I know nobody's going to do that. It's ugly. But I probably, if I was artistic, I could probably make that look a lot nicer. Uh, so <laughs> there we go. All right, where are we here? Dwayne, could we get back to the map <coughs> and see all the geographical points? where Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20 was attested pre-586. Yeah, I think, um, let me zoom in here. We got to zoom in for this to happen. I think what it would look like is this. <laughs> Seriously, I, I'm, I'm half joking here, but the truth is, is uh, every place that we've listed here has attested um, geographically, uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter where you go. It's there. Uh, geographically, it don't matter whether you're up here, whether you're over here, whether you're here, man, even, even in Egypt, okay. Even in Egypt, okay. We have Mark 16, 9 through 20 before the sixth century. We have even here in North Africa. I, I didn't look at Ethiopic um, stuff. I, I understand Ethiopic's a bit later, uh, but I'd be curious uh, where Mark, Mark uh, 16, 9 through 20 is in there. Um, we don't know if that castration story is true. Uh, I feel like I'm missing some context there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Patrick in Ireland, Esnick in Armenia. Yes. Uh, Pastor Brett, I am still looking. Okay. Keep looking. You know what? If I finish the live stream before you find it, Pastor Brett, um, just, um, you got my email. I think I sent you an email a little while ago. Just send it to me. Send it to me. I'd be curious to, to see that. Um, Ross says, do the Bath Old English Gospels carry any weight at all? Yeah, those are late. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know much about it. I mean, when you consider the geographic question, you got to think that like, English, England's all the way up here, right? The Saxons and, and all them, they're there. Uh, so was there much travel going on back and forth there? I, I don't think initially there was. Um, 
but yeah, it wouldn't surprise me that the, uh, um, the old English would have it. Um, LOL, Epiphanius, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> uh, Kevin, Heaven Jones, I didn't know he returned. I know a major part of his life was in Milan along with Ambrose. Okay, that's part of a conversation I missed there. Um, James Snap, 100% of Ethiopic copies support Mark 16, 9 through 10. Okay, so down, down, uh, I can't reach down there. So way down there, way down there. Uh, don't circle Wales and call it England. <laughs> okay. Something like that. I, I don't know. My geography up there is a little bit not happy. Um, don't circle. Uh, yeah. Uh, they carry weight as translations of the Vulgate of the time. Oh, so old, old English came from Vulgate. Very good. Okay. That's good to know. Um, Origins supporter Eusebius recorded the castration story in his church history. He wanted, oh yes, I, I think I briefly heard about this. He wanted it secret, but his bishop didn't like him and exposed him. Right, yeah, I, I had heard some kind of rumor, rumorous talk about a castration done by Origen. Um, I, again, I don't know if that's true or, or what, you know, what relevance it has, to be quite honest. But uh, either way, um, you really don't know. Is, is this it? Okay, you know what? My, my ignorance is on full display. Hang on. I'll just look it up really quick here. Then I don't have to be so ignorant. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, hold on, hold on. I, I think I got it. It's something like this. There we go. Okay, there we go. How's that? Is that better? <laughs> yeah, far flung Ontario, that's right. Uh, okay. You know what? Hang on, hang on. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Okay. Include. I, I actually, heaven, this is, this is for you. I used to live in London, Ontario. I, I was born and raised there. Uh, John Graves Simpoe comes over from, from your land and uh, he comes to the first river he finds in uh, in Canada, names it the Thames. And at the Fork of the Thames, uh, he founded the city called London. And that was supposed to be the capital city of Canada, by the way. Uh, but Toronto, for some reason, gained some favor, uh, which is uh, okay, whatever. Okay. No, but but seriously, he used to live in a place called London. Not not so much, not not anymore. We moved uh, further north. Uh, we we like the cold, apparently. Actually, I don't like the cold, but. Cool. Is that close to Kitchener? Yes. London is about 45 minutes, maybe an hour from Kitchener, uh, just straight up the 401. And uh, right now we're about two and a half hours north of Kitchener. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Include Ireland. Patrick quotes 16. Yes, he does. I did see that. That would be, that would have been a very good, um, what do you call it? Uh, oh. It's late. It's getting late. I can't can't think of the words. Um, would have been a good um, St. Patrick's Day video. That's it. Yeah, Mark 16, 9 through 20, St. Patrick. Uh, Cambridge Corpus Christi College, Manuscript 140, The Bath, Old English Gospels. James Snack, just don't include Ireland in England. Very good. All right. I think I'm about done here. Any early evidence for Mark 16, 9 through 20 in Canada? Uh, yeah, so um, potentially there might be a manuscript find from a 21st century scribe uh, up here in Canada. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, no, uh, maybe frozen up in the tundras of the north and might find something in Canadian. Uh, you know, for they were afraid, eh? Something like that. All right, let me just check real quick on something here. Oh, I didn't realize I'm showing the map. We don't need to see the map anymore. That's good. Where? All right, okay, I think this is a pretty good time to end the live stream. Uh, it's close to 10. I am going to go and probably chill out for a little bit and then go to bed to get up early in the morning to start things all over again. 
All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for uh, spending this hour or so with me. I'm glad to be able to talk to you. I've, I've just been finding the live streams actually have been a little easier to do. Uh, it's a little more stressful getting everything up and running, but the amount of editing that's required of me afterwards is actually significantly less. Um, so I'm still going to be producing that kind of content, um, but uh, when I have an idea that I'm just kind of throwing around in my head, I, I think uh, this is a good avenue to kind of share that and see what others are thinking and... and uh, um, interesting to see heaven didn't really like my geographical argument too much but that's okay uh, maybe it could be refined uh, maybe we could find a bit more stuff there uh, or if it's just not a good argument altogether we could scrap it um, but I'm not done with it yet so um, keep an eye out I got a couple things uh, coming up on the channel here uh, so we've got Peter Gurry at some point I got to reach out to him again and find out when uh, we want to talk about the uh, the Franken text argument and I'm going to do a little bit more work on that because I think uh, we will probably find a bunch more in the ECM and it would be interesting to see where they are and uh, what kind of connections they make. Um, and then I'm hoping to have David Allen Black come on and talk to us about Sturzian, um, Sturzian uh, textual criticism, uh, the Sturzian methodology. Uh, so he's he's got a higher view of the Byzantine text than many others. So it'll be interesting to probe his mind to see what he thinks of some of the stuff. And uh, those are a couple things to look forward to. So anyway, I hope you found this stuff uh, helpful. And until next time, brothers and sisters, we'll see you around.